Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly and I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Mike Williams. He was a 31 year old man from Florida who just mysteriously disappeared one December morning during a trip to a huge lake in Florida called Lake Seminole. When people realised that Mike was missing, so many searchers gathered to the lake in a bid to try and find him, but unfortunately they had no luck and it seemed as though Mike had probably fallen into the water and sadly drowned. However, years later when his case was looked into again by detectives, they started to think that perhaps this wasn't just a tragic accident after all. Perhaps there was more to it than that. Maybe Mike Williams had actually been the victim of foul play. But just before we get into the case, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murder of a young man and it involves heavy themes such as drowning and suicidal thoughts. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back to December of the year 2000 in Tallahassee which is a city located in the state of Florida in the US. Tallahassee is the capital of Florida. And this is Mike Williams. His full name was actually Jerry Michael Williams, but clearly he went by his middle name for the most part, Mike. Mike was 31 years old at the time that this case took place. He was born on the 16th of October, 1969. His father was called Jerry, his mother was called Cheryl, and Mike was one of two siblings. He had a brother named Nick. The Williams family lived in an area called Bradfordville in Florida. Jerry Williams worked as a Greyhound bus driver, Cheryl worked as a daycare provider, and from what I can gather, Mike and Nick had a very normal, happy childhood. Their parents, Jerry and Cheryl, always worked incredibly hard to provide for their sons. They weren't rich by any means, but they were comfortable, and so they were able to send Nick and Mike to good schools, private schools. I read on a couple of sources that the family actually lived in this big trailer rather than buying a house because Jerry and Cheryl wanted to use that money that could have gone on a house on Mike and Nick's private school fees. Cheryl said in a documentary that I watched that as a child Mike was always in a hurry, he was always running anywhere he needed to go, clearly he had so much energy and enthusiasm. Mike always did really well in school growing up, he was intelligent and he studied hard so he got good grades and when he was in high school he went to the North Florida Florida Christian High School. He was voted class president. He took part in a lot of school sports clubs. He loved sports, particularly football. He was on the football team. And it was also in high school when he met the woman who would go on to become his wife, a girl named Denise Merrill. Mike and Denise started dating in the ninth grade and they fell in love. They were high school sweethearts and they were honestly like that stereotypical couple in high school films and TV shows shows because Mike was on the football team and Denise was a cheerleader. They just had an instant connection from the very first day they met. It was literally love at first sight for Mike and Denise. When high school came to an end, Mike became a student at Florida State University where he earned his degree in political science and urban planning. And after this, he went on to get a job in real estate as a property appraiser. He worked for a company called Ketchum Appraisal Group and the company owner, so so I guess Mike's boss actually described Mike as being the quote hardest working man I ever saw. That was Mike. He always worked so hard for anything he ever had in life. He wanted to be successful. He wanted to grow up and be financially stable so that he could provide for the family that he hoped to have one day. And that family obviously started with him and his girlfriend Denise. When Mike was around 24, 25 years old, he and Denise tied the knot. They got married. They married in December of 1994. They bought their first home together and then five years after they became husband and wife, they expanded 
founded their family when Denise gave birth to a baby girl named Ansley in early May of 1999. And by all accounts, they were over the moon when Ansley came along. Mike was over the moon. He adored his daughter so much and he was such a devoted, loving father to her. All in all, Mike Williams was a good man who seemed to have a very happy life. He'd built a good life for himself. He had a good job and he was earning good money. He was married. He had a house. He was close to his family, his mother Cheryl and brother Nick. Unfortunately, by the time this case took place, I think his father Jerry had sadly passed away. But Mike was obviously now a father himself and I'm sure he was really looking forward to watching his daughter grow up. In fact, according to sources, he and Denise were planning on having a second child soon. And that's why it came as such a complete and utter shock to everyone when 31-year-old Mike Williams just suddenly vanished one day in late 2000. The date was the 16th of December 2000 and Mike woke up very early that morning with the intention of going duck hunting on Lake Seminole in Florida, which is something that he did often. Duck hunting was a hobby of his, so he would enjoy going to the lake with friends, but he would also sometimes go on his own too. And as I said, that was his plan for that morning. He was going to go on a solo trip to Lake Seminole and then he was going to return home by midday because he and his wife Denise were going to go on a weekend away as it was actually their sixth wedding anniversary. So they had planned this trip to celebrate the occasion. So Mike woke up, he got dressed, he grabbed his things and then he drove for about an hour until he reached the lake. However, Mike never returned home that day. He told told his wife Denise that he would be back by midday so that they could go on their trip but it got to midday and there was no sign of him. So Denise waited and waited and waited but Mike never walked through the front door and he also wasn't answering his phone. He had a cell phone and every time Denise rang it there was no answer. He didn't pick it up and as time was going by Denise was just starting to worry more and more. She was worried that something bad had happened to her husband because this was so out of character for him. So panicked, Denise decided to ring her father and he alongside Mike's best friend, a man named Brian Winchester and also other friends and family members all decided to get together and head out to the lake to try and find Mike. When they got there, they found Mike's vehicle, his Ford Bronco truck was parked in Jackson County on the side of the lake with his boat trailer attached to the back of it. But there was no sign of his boat and there was no no sign of Mike. It literally looked like his truck had just been abandoned. I believe it was soon after this when the authorities were called to the scene to assist with the search and investigators with the FFWCC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, soon arrived at the lake to help Mike's family and friends look for him. They were searching for hours that afternoon and into the evening but again there was no sign of him anywhere, no trace of Mike. And of of course as it got later and later it just got more cold it was freezing temperatures outside and it became dark so the search had to be called off for the night the search resumed the following morning and I think to start with they mainly focused on the part of the lake around the area where Mike's truck was found so they were searching around the 10 acres which surrounded where his truck was a helicopter was brought in to search the area from above to see if they could spot anything and I think as time was going by and there was still no sign of Mike, quickly people started to believe that he was probably sadly dead. That Mike had most likely gotten into some kind of accident whilst he was duck hunting that morning and he drowned. Investigators thought that his boat may have hit a stump in the water or something which could have caused him to lose his balance and fall into the lake and he went under. And he may not have had much of a chance to try and swim to the surface because it was determined that he probably would have been wearing his fishing waders when he fell in because they weren't found in his truck. If you don't know what fishing waders are, they're basically waterproof boot overalls that most fishermen use. They go right up to your chest and if you think about it, if Mike did fall in the lake that day, 
away then obviously the waders are gonna fill up with water and that's gonna be heavy that's gonna be a lot of extra weight on him making it harder for him to swim up because the water filled waders would help to pull him down they would essentially act as like an anchor attached to him there's also a lot of plants and vegetation underwater in Lake Seminole so investigators began thinking that maybe one of Mike's legs could have gotten tangled up in that again making it harder for him to get back to the surface sadly it really did seem as though that was the direction the case was headed in as the hours ticked by and they still couldn't find him it was looking likely that Mike had drowned in the lake as the result of a tragic accident and then on the 17th of December 2000 about nine hours after the search began something was found it wasn't Mike but it was his boat Mike's best friend Brian Winchester discovered the boat in the water about 300 yards away from the area where authorities theorized Mike would have set off in his boat and many of Mike's things were inside of it they found his life jacket duck decoys his hunting shotgun was in the boat in a case and there were a few things about the bow that seemed a bit odd to the investigators so firstly there was no sign of any kind of a struggle in or on the bow if that makes sense so there was no like mud or water in the boat which seemed a bit strange because if Mike had fallen into the water it's likely that he would have been trying to grab at the boat trying to pull himself up and into it so it's likely that water would have splashed up into the bow um but as I said there was no water in there the bow also wasn't damaged in any way there were no dents in it so it didn't seem like it had hit a stump in the water and that that was what had caused Mike to fall out his gas tank was full I believe so that seemed to rule out the theory that maybe his motor had run out of gas and he was stranded in the middle of the lake and so he tried to swim to land and that was when he drowned so it was difficult for the investigators to try and piece together exactly what had happened here the boat wasn't offering up any clues or explanation and so the search for Mike continued the search was being led by the Fish and Wildlife Commission with the support of the Jackson County Sheriff's Office Mike's case wasn't really being handled by the police because I mean they didn't believe that this was a criminal investigation you know there were no signs of any foul play it really did seem like an accidental drowning case and so the police weren't too involved in the search about 10 days into the search on the 26th of December 2000 another item believed to have belonged to Mike was retrieved from the water it was a hat a hunting hat with a camouflage pattern on it and when this hat was shown to Mike's best friend Brian Winchester he said that he believed that it was Mike's Brian and Mike often went duck hunting together and Brian said that that was the hat that Mike always wore on their hunting trips but still there was no sign of Mike himself and so the search carried on the FFWCC brought in so many boats about 15 boats in total were sent out to different parts of the lake to try and find any trace of him as I said before helicopters were drafted in to scan the area from above dive teams were sent in to search the lake but still they did not find Mike which quite honestly baffled the investigators because before this case occurred over the years about 80 people People in total had tragically drowned in Lake Seminole and every single one of their bodies was eventually recovered by investigators because usually after a person has drowned their body will eventually float to the surface usually within like a couple of days to a week I mean this can vary depending on the conditions and temperatures I believe if it's very cold if the water is colder than normal then that means that bodies can take a little longer to float to the surface Surface. and obviously it was December when Mike drowned it was the winter it was freezing outside so the authorities were expecting it to take a bit longer for his body to come up but but when it got to like day 10 and there was still no sign of his body this was so unusual they would have expected to find him by this point 
but they hadn't. So where was he? If Mike had drowned in Lake Seminole, which the majority of people believe that he had, then why hadn't his remains come to the surface yet? Well, one major theory as to why this might have been was that perhaps Mike had actually been eaten by alligators. There are apparently hundreds of alligators in Lake Seminole, so that did become a big theory in the case. A lot of people started to believe that after he drowned, that Mike's remains were eaten by alligators and that's why no body ever came to the surface because there was no body anymore. However, whilst there were many people that did think the alligator theory was true, there were others that were more sceptical. They didn't believe it, including Mike's own mother, Cheryl. She did not believe that her son had been eaten by alligators because of the fact that alligators mostly sleep when it's cold. They're dormant in the winter and I think for this reason Mike usually only ever went duck hunting in the winter because he knew that there wouldn't be any alligators about but let's just say for argument's sake that Mike was attacked by an alligator it's very unlikely that an alligator would swallow a human body whole because it's big so they would usually tear body parts off and chew on them so in that case surely the remnants of some of Mike's remains would have still floated to the surface Surface, but they hadn't. So this also seemed to discredit the alligator theory. As the weeks and the months went by, the search for Mike Williams continued at Lake Seminole. And then more than six months after Mike disappeared, in early June of 2001, something else was recovered from the water. It was a pair of waders, wader boots, like the kind that Mike wore on his hunting trips. And then just days after this, a flashlight and hunting jacket was also recovered from the water, both of which, again, investigators believed may have belonged to Mike. And this was pretty much confirmed when they looked in one of the pockets of the jacket. Inside the pocket, they found a hunting license. And the name on this license was Jerry Williams. Jerry was obviously Mike's first name. So the discovery of these items seemed to, again, indicate that yes, Mike had drowned in the lake. He'd fallen in and finally some of his belongings had risen to the top. But on a closer look at these items, again, there were things about them that didn't quite add up. So for example, there were no teeth marks or anything on them, no teeth marks on the wader boots, which seemed to also suggest that Mike hadn't been attacked by an alligator. Because if he had, you would expect to see some teeth marks or some damage to the boots or the jacket. But also something that seemed really odd was that there was no sign of any like decomposition or deterioration of human body parts inside of the waders. Mike's limbs were not in there and perhaps the boots could have just come straight off after he drowned. Maybe Mike himself was able to get them off during the struggle. But then if that was the case, why had it taken more than six months for them to float to the surface? Also, there was no like algae or slime from the vegetation in the water on or in the boots which is something that you would expect to see if, say, maybe the boots had gotten tangled up in the weeds and plants underwater, and that's why it had taken so long for them to come to the surface. But there was none of that, which didn't really make much sense. The flashlight that they recovered from the water, which they believed may have belonged to Mike, was still working. It had supposedly been in the water for six months, and yet it still worked when they found it. And it just seemed strange that pretty much much everything else relating to Mike Williams, everything that he had with him that day, his boat, his shotgun, his wader boots, his jacket, his flashlight, his hunting license, all of these items were eventually found and recovered from the lake. The only thing that was still missing was him was Mike's body. Still, there was no sign of any remains. But despite that, it was following the discovery of the wader boots and Mike's jacket and hunting license when it was decided by a Tallahassee judge that Mike Williams would now be declared legally dead. The judge found that the items recovered from the water did indicate that Mike had sadly drowned and possibly been eaten by alligators. And so they 
they signed a death certificate for Mike saying that his cause of death was accidental drowning even though his body was never found and this resulted in the search for him basically coming to an end. The case was considered closed now. Dive teams and investigators had searched the lake extensively over the months and they never found him so I guess at some point they are forced to stop. There was nothing else that they could do. They had to stop looking for him, which is awful. It breaks my heart for the Williams family that not only had they lost Mike so suddenly, but they also never got his body back. They were never going to be able to bury him or have a proper funeral because that was it. The search was over. They had a death certificate, but no body to show for it, which is the reason why Mike's mother, Cheryl, never really believed that her son was dead. Despite what everyone else was telling her, despite investigators saying to her, look, we found all of this evidence. We've recovered his belongings from the water. It's pretty clear that he did drown that day. She just didn't believe it. She couldn't. Cheryl Williams believed deep down in her heart that her son was not in that lake. She believed that there was a chance he could still be alive. She pretty much refused to believe otherwise until there was proof, until his body had been found, she had hoped that he was still alive. In fact, about eight days after Mike's disappearance, on Christmas Eve of 2000, Cheryl went to the lake. She went to Lake Seminole, where obviously search teams were still trying to find her son. She was standing right by the the water and she described how all of a sudden she just heard this voice in her head which said to her quote Mike is not in Lake Seminole you have to find him and bring him home so I think from that point on she never really believed that her son had drowned and so even after he was declared legally dead and the case was effectively closed Cheryl Williams never gave up the search for her son she did everything she possibly possibly could to keep his story alive, to spread awareness of her son's disappearance, because she believed that there was more to it, that this wasn't just a case of accidental drowning, because there were so many things that just did not point to this, that didn't add up, like the alligator theory, the fact that alligators are basically dormant in the winter, the fact that Mike's belongings just suddenly turned up in the lake after months of searching, with no indication that they'd been in the water for a long period period of time. So it almost seemed to Cheryl that they had possibly been planted there shortly before they were found. As I said, Cheryl never wanted to believe that her son was dead. She always hoped that he would be found alive, but I think there was a part of her that believed that if he was dead, then he may have been the victim of foul play rather than accidental drowning because of all of these strange things that didn't make sense if this was an accidental drowning case. So what Cheryl wanted was for there to be a proper criminal investigation into her son's disappearance. She wanted law enforcement to reopen the case and so she did everything she possibly could to advocate for this. She created missing posters with Mike's face on and she distributed them around the area and surrounding areas. She put ads in the newspaper, she created and put up billboards, she went on marches where she would hold up these signs. Literally anything she could do to spread Mike's story and get people talking about the case, I guess, in the hopes that this would pressure the authorities to reopen it. And she did this for years. She spent years just begging law enforcement to help her find her son and bring him home. And for so long, she was just turned away and ignored, essentially. Or at least that was until early 2004, more than three years after her son went missing, when finally the Florida Department of Law Enforcement agreed to relaunch the case and look into it. I guess from a new perspective that perhaps foul play might have been involved in Mike's disappearance. The detectives assigned to Mike's case in 2004 basically decided to go over everything again. All of the evidence, all of the statements taken, they were going to look at all of the people involved in the initial search for Mike, like his family and friends, just to see if there was something that the previous investigators involved in the case could have missed. And I believe it was whilst they were doing this when one person in particular kind of stood out to the detectives and that person was Brian 
Winchester, Mike's best friend. When the police went over the facts of the case and the reports from the searches of the lake, there was something odd that they noticed about Brian. And that was that out of all of the many, many searches, he seemed to be the one who found a lot of the evidence relating to Mike at the lake. Well, if you recall from earlier on in the video, the day after Mike went missing, his boat was found in the water and Brian was the one who found it, which now looking back, detectives thought, well, that was a bit of a coincidence. Out of all of the people that were there that day looking for Mike and the boat, he just happened to be the one who found it. As soon as he arrived to the lake that day, he was the one who discovered it. I think he found it quite quickly too, almost like he maybe knew where it was. In addition to that, when the hunting hat was later recovered from the water, Brian was the one who said that he was pretty certain that it was Mike's. Even though I believe this couldn't be confirmed when it was DNA tested, they couldn't find Mike's DNA on or in the hat. I don't know, it just seemed a bit coincidental to the detectives, a bit fishy, and so they decided to look a little more into Brian, and when they did, something else about him stood out. Now, Brian worked as an insurance agent. He sold life insurance policies, and it turns out that shortly before Mike disappeared, Brian wrote out a life insurance policy for his best friend for the amount of one million now, what's odd about this is that apparently Mike already had two life insurance policies that he'd taken out prior to this. He had one for $250,000 and then another for $500,000 because, you know, he wanted to protect his loved ones. If anything ever did happen to him, he wanted his family to be okay and taken care of. So with this $1 million life insurance, that makes three policies that he had. Now, Mike's wife, Denise Williams was the beneficiary of his life insurance. When he died, she would have gotten all this money. And how this links back to Brian Winchester is that the police learned that after Mike disappeared, Denise and Brian actually got together themselves. They started dating. Denise started dating her deceased husband's, or presumed dead husband's, best friend. Apparently she dated a couple of other guys after Mike disappeared and then eventually she and Brian got together. Brian divorced his own wife Kathy in 2003 and then following this he and Denise publicly announced that they were now a couple which as you can imagine was quite upsetting for Mike's family. The fact that the love of Mike's life was now with his best friend. I'm sure it was quite uncomfortable for the family but alas they were together they got married in December of 2005 so Denise became Denise Winchester and they moved in together. But what was even more strange about this new relationship was the fact that after they became a couple Brian and Denise just lived together in Mike's house, in the house that he and Denise brought together, which again just did not sit right with people. You would think that Denise and Brian would want to live somewhere else together, start fresh in another house, not live in the same place where Mike lived, not sleep in the same room that used to be Mike and Denise's, you know? I mean, it wasn't like they couldn't afford it, let's be honest, with all the life insurance money Denise had now after Mike was declared legally dead. In fact, let's talk more about that for a minute, Mike being declared legally dead, because that was another thing that stood out to people and detectives as being a bit bizarre, because it turns out that it was Denise who was very much pushing for the state to issue her missing husband's death certificate. It seemed as though she wanted him to be declared legally dead as fast as possible. Now, usually missing people who are presumed dead are not actually declared legally dead for years and years after they disappear, but Mike was declared legally dead after just six months because his wife was pushing for it so much possibly because she wanted to get her hands on the life insurance money as quickly as she could and obviously you can't claim someone's life insurance without providing their death certificate. Another thing that seemed really strange about Denise was the fact that she had essentially threatened 
her mother-in-law, Mike's mother, Cheryl, because like we discussed earlier, after her son went missing, Cheryl was doing everything she could to try and find him and find out what happened to him because she wasn't convinced that he had just tragically accidentally drowned in Lake Seminole. She believed there may have been more to it than that. And so, as we know, she was campaigning and doing everything she could to persuade the authorities to look more into this and actually conduct a proper criminal investigation into her son's disappearance and Denise was not happy about this. She was angry and so she said to Cheryl, if you carry on with this, if you keep trying to get a criminal investigation, I will not allow you to see your granddaughter, Mike's daughter, ever again. Which of course absolutely devastated Cheryl. She'd already lost her son and now her daughter-in-law was threatening to ban her from seeing her grandchild. But despite this threat, Cheryl wouldn't stop stop. She refused to give up the search for her son, even if it meant that she couldn't see her granddaughter. And Denise stuck to her word. She refused to let Cheryl and her daughter have any form of contact. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why would Denise do this? Why would she not want there to be a criminal investigation into her husband's disappearance? Surely she would want the police to do everything they could to find Mike. Unless, of course, she had something to do with whatever had happened to him. It was when the detectives involved in the criminal investigation started piecing this all together when they thought, hang on, maybe Denise and Mike's best friend, Brian Winchester, were in on this together. Maybe before Mike disappeared, they decided that they wanted to be together and so they decided to get rid of Mike and also basically live a life of luxury together with his life insurance money. I mean, it was Brian who issued that $1 million life insurance policy shortly before Mike disappeared. Maybe Mike had no idea that Brian had done that. Maybe Brian and Denise went behind his back so that when he disappeared and was eventually declared legally dead, they could claim all this money and live happily ever after together. There were so many suspicious things surrounding this new couple, so many things that indicated that Brian and Denise might have had something to do with Mike Williams' disappearance. But at the same time, unfortunately, the detectives were never able to obtain any solid concrete evidence to prove this, to prove that they were responsible. And so they couldn't do anything. They couldn't arrest and charge Brian or Denise with anything. And so sadly, this criminal investigation never went anywhere and Mike's case unfortunately went cold. If Brian and Denise were involved, it looked as though they were going to get away with it. A couple of years passed and the case kind of stood at a standstill. Again, Mike's mother Cheryl was continuing to do everything she could to get answers and spread awareness of her son's disappearance. And from what I can gather, the case was briefly reopened and reinvestigated investigated again in 2008 but once again it eventually went cold and there were no major developments or at least that was until August of 2016 more than 15 years after Mike Williams vanished when his ex-wife Denise Winchester reported to the police that she had just been abducted at gunpoint by Brian Winchester. Now, just for some extra context here, obviously, as we know, following Mike's disappearance, Brian and Denise eventually got together and they married and they were, I guess, happily married for a good few years until November of 2012, when problems started arising in their marriage. They started arguing a lot. According to some sources, Brian apparently had a sex addiction, which put a strain on their relationship. And so in November of 2012, they split split up and separated and a couple of years after this in 2015 Denise officially filed for divorce and clearly Brian was not happy about this he was angry at Denise for trying to divorce him and so on the 5th of August 2016 he abducted her. That morning, Denise left her home and she got into her car and started driving. I think she was on her way to work. And what she didn't realise was that Brian was hiding in the back of the car and he was armed with a gun. And at some point, as Denise was driving, she looked into her rearview mirror and she saw him climbing over the back seat. Brian started shouting at Denise and giving her directions, telling her to drive to 
to a certain place, I think towards a wooded area. And according to reports, initially she refused. She said no, but then Brian showed her his gun and he threatened her with it. And so she carried on driving. Apparently Brian got really upset. He threatened to kill himself. He said that now that Denise had divorced him, he had nothing to live for. And then eventually Denise pulled into a drugstore parking lot rather than going to the woods like he told her to. And I believe she managed to calm Brian down. She was trying to talk to him calmly and convince him to put the gun down and leave her alone. She was saying anything that she could to try and get herself out of this dangerous situation and it worked. Brian did calm down and when they got to this parking lot he got out of the vehicle and he left. But not before he grabbed his bag out of the car and in this bag he was carrying various items like a tarpaulin sheet, a tool, some bleach which really made alarm bells ring because it seemed as though maybe he was planning on killing Denise. Why else would he be carrying these kinds of items? Maybe he intended to use them to dispose of her body after murdering her. Maybe that's why initially he told her to drive out to the woods because he intended to kill her there. After Brian left, Denise went straight to the police and she reported that her ex had just abducted her at gunpoint. She was interviewed about her ordeal and of course the detectives knew who she was. They knew that she was the ex-wife of missing Mike Williams. They knew of the suspicions surrounding her and Brian Winchester. And so as well as talking to her about the abduction, another detective who had been investigating Mike's case came in and he began asking Denise a couple of questions about Mike. He was asking her things like, oh, do you think Brian could have had something to do with your ex-husband's disappearance? To which she said, no. She said that she would have never started a relationship with him if she thought that that was true. They asked her, like, where do you think Mike is? Where do you think his body is buried? What do you think actually happened to him? And she said that she believed he drowned on the lake. She had always believed that and she still did. She believed that his death was an accident. So the detective basically said to her something along the lines of, what, even after what happened today, even after Brian abducted you at gunpoint, you still believe he had nothing to do with Mike's disappearance? And she said, yes, yeah, she did not believe he was involved. But she was also just trying to dodge the questions about Mike's case as much as she possibly could. Every time the detective brought up Mike, she would either try to change the subject or she would just say things like, I can't talk about that right now. I can't think about that. What they obviously wanted from Denise was a confession. They wanted her to finally admit that she and Brian were responsible for Mike's disappearance, but clearly Denise wasn't going to admit to anything anytime soon, and so they turned their attention to Brian to see what they could get out of him. Brian was arrested and charged with aggravated kidnapping with a firearm as well as a couple of other charges I believe and he was looking at a life sentence for all of these charges. He was looking at a minimum of 30 years in prison and he didn't want that obviously so he decided to come to an agreement with investigators. Brian Winchester told detectives that he would tell them everything. He would finally tell them the full truth about what really happened to Mike Williams all those years ago, as long as prosecutors didn't seek a life sentence for the kidnapping charge, and also, I believe, as long as he would be granted immunity in the Mike Williams case. Brian basically said that he was already going to prison for a very long time anyway, so either they can try and get him even more time for the kidnapping charges and they never find out what happened to Mike or they grant him immunity and don't seek the life sentence and in return they finally discover the truth and the detectives desperate to find out what actually happened to Mike Williams and finally get answers for his family agreed and Brian sat down with them and he gave his account of what happened that cold winter's day in December of 2000. Just quickly before we get into that I'll just fill you in on what Brian did receive for the charges against him including the kidnapping charge. So for that he was sentenced to 20 years in prison 
prison in December of 2017 as well as a 15 year probation period after that I believe. But anyway back to his confession. So Brian sat down with the detectives and he admitted that yes both he and Mike's wife Denise were involved in his death. Brian said that he and Denise had actually been having an affair for years before Mike's death. They'd known each other for a very very long time since preschool and they'd been seeing each other behind Mike's back since 1997. So they were both cheating on their spouses. Denise was cheating on her husband Mike and Brian was cheating on his wife Kathy. So this affair between them began. They were secretly together for a couple of years until eventually I guess they reached a point where they didn't want to hide it anymore. It was becoming too difficult to hide. In addition to that it's been reported that Mike and Denise started having trouble in their marriage. Apparently they were arguing a lot about things like money and finances and so Brian said that together he and Denise came up with a plan. Brian said that he was going to divorce his wife Kathy but that Denise didn't want to just divorce Mike because she believed that that came with a lot of shame. I think she was very religious, her family were very religious and so she didn't want to get divorced because it was frowned upon and she was worried about how that would look and she was someone who very much cared about how she appeared to other people. Divorcing Mike was apparently not an option for her and so Brian said that she suggested that they get rid of Mike and try to make it look like an accident. So from what Brian was saying, Denise was, I guess, the mastermind behind this whole thing. She came up with the idea to kill Mike and Brian was willing to go along with it because apparently murder was less shameful than divorce to her. Denise said that they should take Mike out to the lake, Lake Seminole, where he would often go duck hunting with his best friend Brian, and that whilst there, they should try to drown him. Prior to this, clearly Brian and Denise also came up with the idea to add an extra life insurance policy for Mike for $1 million. And then in December of 2000, they put their plan into action. It was the morning of the 16th of December 2000 when Mike and Brian went to Lake Seminole together whilst Denise stayed at home and waited. And obviously Mike was under the impression that they were going to go duck hunting together. He had no idea about what his wife and best friend had planned to do to him. When they got to the lake they went out on Mike's bow and Brian said that at some point Mike stood up whilst he was in the bow and Brian saw this as his opportunity. As soon as Mike stood up he pushed him into the water, into the lake, and he believed that he would drown because Mike had the wader boots on at the time. So Brian believed that the boots would quickly fill up with water and they would pull Mike down. However, that is not what happened because Brian said that as Mike was struggling in the water, he was able to remove his jacket and also the wader boots that were pulling him down. And after removing them, he swam over to this stump in the lake, which he was holding on to. So Brian's plan had had failed. Clearly Mike was not going to drown and so Brian had to do something else in order to kill him. And so whilst Mike was in the water holding on to the stump, very scared and panicked and I imagine incredibly confused, Brian grabbed his shotgun he loaded it and he started circling Mike in the bow. He aimed the shotgun at Mike and fired it once and the bullet hit Mike in the head and he died. Brian then grabbed Mike's body out of the water and he knew that because of the bullet wound to his head he couldn't let his body drown. He had to hide him somewhere else now. So he put Mike's body in his vehicle and he started just driving around thinking about what he could do with him until eventually he drove to to the edge of a lake in Leon County called Car Lake and he decided to bury Mike in the mud there. He wrapped him up in a tarpaulin sheet, dug a grave using a shovel and put Mike in there and then covered it up. He then cleaned out his car and later pretended to be so concerned when he heard that his best friend was missing and he went to Lake Seminole to go and help look for him. And I believe as the searches continued he planted a load of the evidence, a load of Mike's belongings in Lake Seminole to make it look like Mike had accidentally drowned. As we know 
he conveniently discovered Mike's bow on day two of the search and I believe he later planted like Mike's hat and the wader boots and jacket and flashlight in the water to convince investigators that the drowning story was true. So after giving this confession to the detectives, authorities went straight to the place where Brian said he buried Mike in the hopes of finally recovering his remains after all these years and that is exactly what they did on the 18th of October 2017. They started digging up the mud in an area on the edge of the car lake until eventually they found a body which when DNA tested was confirmed to have been Mike Williams and he still had his wedding ring on his finger. On the 8th of May 2018 Mike's ex-wife Denise Williams was arrested and charged in relation to his death. She was charged with first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder which she completely denied. She maintained her innocence and said that her ex Brian was lying that she was not involved in Mike's death and so the case against her was headed to trial. Denise's trial began later that same year in December around the 18th anniversary of Mike's murder and during her trial her ex-husband and co-conspirator Brian Winchester took to the stand as the main witness for the prosecution. The recording of Brian's first confession was played out in court and Brian also spoke about the crime there. He talked the jury through exactly what happened, how Denise came up with the the idea and then how the whole plan unfolded, how they committed this crime. When the trial came to a close the jury was sent off for deliberation and after eight hours they returned with their verdict of guilty. Denise Williams was guilty of both charges including first degree murder and she was sentenced to life imprisonment. Now Denise and her legal team pretty much immediately tried to appeal her conviction and sentence and they did have some success with this because her first degree murder conviction was ultimately overturned in November of 2020. I guess on the basis that there was no evidence that she was involved in the actual murder. There was evidence that she was involved in the planning but not in the murder. I mean Brian had admitted that he carried out the murder himself. So her first degree murder conviction was overturned but the conspiracy to commit murder conviction remained which carried a 30 year prison sentence. So prison is where Denise and Brian Winchester remain to this day. It's quite insane isn't it though that Denise ended up having a longer sentence than Brian when Brian was the one who committed the actual murder but of course he was granted immunity in the Mike Williams case because he gave his confession so he only ended up being sentenced for the kidnapping charge. But that concludes this case. That is the crazy case of Mike Williams. As horrible as this this case is. I'm so happy that Mike's family were finally able to get some answers and that they were finally able to give him a proper burial after so many years of him being missing. And I'm sure that you'll all agree that the main person to thank for that is obviously Mike's mum Cheryl. She truly is the hero of this case. If it wasn't for her constantly pushing for a proper criminal investigation, I really believe that Mike's body never would have been found. Denise and Brian would have escape justice and the majority of people would still believe to this day that Mike accidentally drowned in Lake Seminole. The truth never would have been revealed. It was Cheryl's determination to never give up the search for her son that is the reason his killers are sitting in jail today. I really believe that. But yeah, that is it for this case. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments. I always want to hear what you guys have to say. I want to hear your opinions um, and also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Again, you can let me know in the comments down below. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another Mystery with Molly. Bye!